President Joe Biden is planning to spend a lot of your money, like six trillion dollars worth, today on the BizPo Show. Welcome to the Biz Post Show. I'm Dan Geltrude, and I am here with my favorite co-host, Mr. Aww. Seth Denson. Seth, how goes things down in Texas? Dude, did you get some sleep, man? I'm feeling loved. I, I don't normally feel that from you, man, but I, I appreciate it, certainly. Uh, you know, listen, things are good. You know, we've got a lot of rain going on down here these days. I don't know what who, when we decided that May... Uh, was going to be the month of rain, but this whole last month was full of rain. But, you know, May f showers bring June flowers? I don't know. Is that a thing? <laughs> whatever whatever makes it work, right? So, exactly. Exactly. Well, well, listen, you know, you and I have been pretty active uh, actually working together. And, and we, we had a, a segment last week in which we, we did a little feuding. Right. That we did. Listen, uh, a big thanks to our friends over at Newsmax who have realized the power of Geltrude and Denson on camera, I think. Uh, yeah, the financial feud. So if you're watching this today on Monday, be sure to tune in tomorrow on Tuesday as Dan and I will certainly go at it again. But I will tell you, it was interesting. You know, for those who have been a longtime listener to the show, uh, you, you know that Dan and I do tend to agree on a lot of things. But sometimes there's things that I don't know, maybe we disagree. We just see them differently. Is that is that a nice Southern way of saying that? Yeah, I think so. I, I, I think that, you know, no two people are exactly the same, right? So, of course, we have different points of view because we come from very different parts of the country. And certainly, I think that influences how, how we see the world. And that's, and that's a good thing. But I got to tell you, Seth, at least on my side, it seemed like it was pretty much a unanimous decision that that I won that debate. Uh, I don't know what you're hearing on your side. Well, I don't know. I just I know that you said your mom called you afterward and said that she won, but I just I, I need to let you know and I, and I know I told her I wouldn't, but she called me afterwards and she said that she had to tell you that. So, <laughs> uh, you know, I get it. Um, but um, no, listen, it was fun. I think we'll we'll we'll, we'll call it uh, a draw. I think that we both made some really valid points, um, but nonetheless, uh, the good news is we'll be back at it tomorrow, and we'll see. Uh, we'll see. We'll go around two. How about that? Uh, we certainly will see. And and I got to tell you, let me just say this, Seth, is that I am a strong believer in the Second Amendment, and I just want to let you know I'm going to be bringing these guns oh, to the feud. <laughs> well. Um, Everything's bigger in Texas, buddy. That's all I'm just going to say to that. So. <laughs> well, we'll see about that tomorrow. <laughs> Fair enough. Well, listen, speaking of things to debate about, how about your president, Joe Biden, who is talking about some wild spending here, Seth, and I really want to get your point of view on, on what you think the impact of all this money being spent is going to have because he's certainly saying it's a good thing and and there's other people in Washington agreeing with him. What's going on in Texas from that point of view? You know, listen, here's my just general take on this. Uh, we need to define what good really is anymore. If good means that, you know, this helps you buy votes, okay, then yeah, this is good policy. Uh, if good means that uh, the mainstream media is going to continue to say that you're fantastic, okay. Um, then I guess this is good policy. But if this means longevity and stability of our country and our financial system, I can't see where this is good. You can't pump this kind of money into the system and continue to spend uh, and expect it to be a good thing. I mean, as you teased at the very top, we're talking about a $6 trillion budget. Listen, I remember even those on the left when President Trump was touting a $4 trillion budget and they were up in arms. The left! And now the left is pushing a six trillion, and that six trillion today that's going to grow to eight point two trillion by 2031. So they're getting ahead of this and saying, "Hey, we're just going to spend, spend, spend." But 
again, this money has to come from somewhere. And I know that the Biden administration is claiming that it's going to come from taxing the rich. But as we've talked about a lot on this show, money is mobile. I don't know that money is going to stay in the United States. I would agree, Seth. I, I think that if you're talking about the type of taxation that Joe Biden is proposing, it's just not going to work. And uh, I guess we're going to have to unfortunately get there to find out, right? We, we have to actually pass the bill before we find out what's in it. I think that some of that we're going to have to, at least from the Democratic side of the, of the aisle, is, well, we're going to have to spend all this money to see how it works. Well, I could already tell you how it's going to work, and we're seeing it already. Inflation. Right now, that is the hidden tax that's out there, because as everything gets more expensive and we see it already, Seth, we see it everywhere. Everything is becoming more expensive. As that happens, the people that the Biden administration is claiming that they want to help the people who are struggling, when you make things more expensive, you're doing anything but helping them. You are making really the essentials in life becoming so expensive that, well, what else is there? And this is a really slippery slope for us to go down. I would like to think that the inflationary period that we're in right now would be temporary. And as demand and demand is way up there right now and supply catches up as the pandemic subsides, well, well, we'll get to that equilibrium point. However, if you continue to spend in this fashion, you actually never catch up. So therefore, you are really feeding inflation over and over and over again. And that's really what everybody should be talking about. Yeah, I tend to agree, uh, although I'm going to I'm going to bring up a couple points and I want your take on it because we may see eye to eye, but we may not on this one. And and that is that I agree that right, everything that the Biden administration is proposing is tax and spend. If we were having a conversation around tax and save or tax and pay down debt, they might win me over on some of this because I recognize for the longevity of the stability of our system, we're going to have to at some point start paying down debt or learn Mandarin. And quite frankly, I think I'm too old to do that. So we probably ought to start figuring out what we're going to do with our debt. The second piece of this, and this is something I found myself not really agreeing much with Janet Yellen, and you and I may or may not disagree on this. I actually do agree that some inflation is a good thing, but I think it's a good thing in large part because what inflation does is it oftentimes will push us to increase interest rates. We cannot build a sustainable system with 0% interest rates. Money can't be loaned for free because when it is, there becomes too much in there. And then the other issue is the ability to save does not have that much of a return. Banks need higher interest rates. People that want to retire and live off of that savings need some interest rates. And so while I'm in favor of some inflation, in large part because the pre primary focus when you see inflation is to raise interest rates, my fear is going back full circle is that the Biden administration will not push to raise interest rates and the Fed won't push to raise interest rates in large part because they want to buy votes. And free money gets you votes. I'm going to have a tough time disagreeing with you on those points, Seth. So let, let me provide you with my insight here. So as far as spending, the primary example I can give you right now how this administration and quite frankly prior administrations were not at all concerned about reigning in the spending is this. Joe Biden wants to fund or further fund the IRS. Now, maybe nobody likes the IRS because nobody really wants to pay taxes, but we have to recognize Paying taxes is a necessary thing, and you need an agency to oversee that process. So he wants to expand the IRS and be able to do more audits and to be able to collect more taxes that are owed. There's a lot of tax cheats out there. So the investment is $80 billion, and the return is projected to be $700 billion over a 10-year period. But here's the rub. 
It's not to say, all right, look at all this money we can save. It's to spend more. So even when you go out there and find money, quote unquote, it's only for the purpose to be able to spend it. So that tells me no one is serious about what's happening with our debt. To the next point related to interest rates, I agree that you have to have interest rates uh, higher than zero in order for the economy to truly function the best way possible. But raising interest rates will have consequences. And those consequences, at least for politicians, means potentially losing votes. And I have been told, and I agree with this completely, if you want to understand which way a politician will vote on an issue, simply look at what will get them reelected. It has nothing to do with what's right. And that's the problem that we have. And a much bigger issue to deal with on that is term limits, because I believe that's the answer to take away the incentive of the constant drive towards reelection. Yeah, I listen. I think that you're you're spot on there. I I might take to task the idea that we need to expand the IRS, and the only reason I say that is I would rather see us simplify the tax code. Simplify the tax code; it makes it a little bit easier for systematically us to manage income and identify those loopholes. We have such a complex tax code that loopholes get exacerbated or, or utilized because they can. Um, and so, uh, you know, while I understand why the Biden administration is doing this on the, just the sheer numbers, it makes sense. Um, but I would rather us see us instead of investing in more people to collect money, simplify the way to collect money and systematize it. Uh, and then that makes everybody's life easier. Um, on the other thing, and maybe, and I don't know, we'll have time to get into this today, but maybe it's a topic for the next one. I think that there is a, a there is a victimized grouping of people that are victimized when interest rates are so low and we don't talk about them enough and that's people who can't get access to credit because of bad credit scores and they become victims of predatory lending because predatory lenders these payday loan shops these effective lending sharks in boxes are able to borrow money at such a low rate and charge at an exorbitant rate and I think that is something we need to have greater oversight of and talk about. I know I've thrown that in there and we didn't even, you know, that, that's certainly out of left field. But I think that this is the problem. When low interest rates are where they are, you, people like you and me can take advantage of it. But the people that are typically unable to access the credit systems, they get victimized by it. Uh, and, and, and so my hope is, is that we can shift things around a little bit, get more on an even playing field. Uh, and get back to a, a, a fundamental basis of economics that, unfortunately, we're just not seeing. But to your point, that doesn't buy votes. Well, that what you just brought up there is a tremendous topic. And although we don't have time to really go into that deeply right now, I really think what you're bringing up is something that is completely swept under the carpet as to who ultimately really gets punished by low interest rates. And there's a lot, there's other groups as well. I mean, those seniors that are trying to, to save and hold on to their dollars and so on with low interest rates in the bank, that doesn't work. But let's, let's keep that one on hold and we're definitely gonna revisit that. So coming up next are our final thoughts. Stay tuned. Welcome back to the BizPost Show. If you're a regular viewer, you know that Seth and I like to leave you with our final thoughts each week. So here's mine. Well, today is Memorial Day, so happy Memorial Day. I hope you're enjoying the day barbecuing or whatever it is that you do to get together with family and friends. But of course, it's not just the start of the summer season and of great weekends, uh, it, it has a greater meaning, doesn't it? it? The meaning here is those who have given the ultimate sacrifice for our country. And I believe that those who have done that have done so so that all of us 
can enjoy how great our country is and how we have the ability to be free. And you want to know what? If you're at one of those barbecues and you're having an argument with one of your family members about your different political views, well, great. We have that right to disagree and to have those debates. That's what it's all about. But let's not forget the reason that we have that freedom is because somebody out there on a battlefield gave that to us. And that's something that we should never, ever lose sight of. So for all of you out there today enjoying your freedom, remember, it wasn't for free. It came at a dear price to so many of our bravest through our country's history. Well, Dan, mine uh, is along the same lines. Uh, I'm thinking about November 9th, 2002. The day before, I found out that my childhood best friend was killed in preparation and lead up to the Iraqi war. Specialist Jonathan Staley, born and raised in Midland, Texas, alongside me. And on November the 8th, 2002, he died in the field. It was a sad day for me, but a prideful day to recognize that my friend was willing to give his life for his country. And it's one of those days that I have remembered him every Memorial Day, quite frankly, many other days in between. So my final thought today on this Memorial Day in 2021 is the same as it has been, really, for the past 20 years. On my friend Jonathan, as you mentioned earlier, some gave so many, freedom isn't free. And some gave all, so did Jonathan. And my appreciation is to them. And that's my final thought. Well, God bless Jonathan. And that does it for this week's show. We hope that you'll tell your friends about us and, of course, that you'll continue to tune in each week. From New York City, I'm Dan Geltrude. And from Dallas, Texas, I'm Seth Denson. Good night.